What's up, sweetie? If you hug me, uh, yeah, if you if that's something that you want to do. That's not real. You just staged that. We are a working podcast right now. Uh, what What do you think that? What What should we name the podcast? I have no clue. That's not a very good name. No, I don't know what the podcast should be named. Just give me something random. Uh, Salisbury steak. What? <laughs> All right. What are you doing now? Do you need me for something? I'll be done in a few minutes. All right. Close that door. All right. Kids these days. I'm a filmmaker. I'm a scientist. And we're two friends who've made movies together. And launched a company together. And we lost our money. And our identity. But we are finding ourselves again. And this is our podcast. This is it. Welcome. In today's episode, we do a little palate cleansing from the usual verbosity and keep it chill with a couple short discussions. First of all, I don't think that you can not be verbose. What? How dare you? And second, you just didn't want to edit the extra two hours of controversial topics that we dug into. How dare you call my love for Keanu Reeves controversial? It got weird. You're weird. And verbose. Coming up, we talk about the COVID vaccine and what the hell is going on in those little vials of witchcraft. After that, I give an update on the feature film project that I'm trying to get off the ground and the pain-filled marathon that is movie making. All that and more on episode seven. Oh, thank heaven. I got my vaccine today. Oh, nice. Pfizer. <laughs> Pfizer. That's good. That's what uh, uh, That's what my wife got. I saw this meme of like, it was a picture of like a drunken club guy, like in the face of a girl who clearly didn't want to be talking to him. It was just a photo. And the caption was the future convert small talk of, you know, clubs in the future. And he was saying Pfizer or Moderna. And it was just a hilarious little encapsulation because I've already sort of heard that in small talk around me. Or now Johnson and Johnson. Oh, that is always. I, I went out of my way not to ask you <laughs> because that it's become so ingrained now that I now more and more people I know are getting vaccinated. Everyone's like, "Oh, which one did you get?" So I saw something that I don't know. A news outlet posted sort of CDC. It, I, I guess it wasn't an official recommendation because it's no longer a recommendation. But at the time, it was saying people who have had COVID could get one dose as opposed to the two which was interesting. I'm curious your thoughts on. Now, they because there's still too many unknowns, that's not an official recommendation. The official recommendation for me would be to follow through with my second dose in three weeks. But I'm curious, the nature of the vaccine and the nature of antibodies, what would one dose for someone who's had it versus two? Like, what's going on there? And is, is there a reason to get the second dose or in all likelihood? Because I know they're saying... Well, we still don't know X, Y, or Z, but we've talked before. That's kind of their baseline. Well, we don't know. I'm curious what the likelihood is. So I can tell you my understanding of it with the caveat that I am not a virologist and I may be wrong about this. When you get a vaccine, it, it induces an immune response. That is not in question, right? That's just how it works. Not everybody gets a strong enough immune response to fully activate their their long-lasting immune system, right? So there are, is long lasting immune response and there's short, short acting immune, immune response. And I don't know if you are familiar with the phrase activation energy, but it's kind of a chemistry term. Like sometimes this would be great if I could draw you a picture, something will, you'll put energy into a system and it will ramp up, you know, like the edge of a bell curve at a certain point, it just won't go any higher, right? If, if the peak of that, uh, of that energy gets above a certain point, the activation energy it will spike it into a much, now it becomes a downhill reaction, right? Like it, you no longer have to put more energy in to keep it going. So an immune response, my understanding is that it's someone like, somewhat like that. To get the long acting, you have to get your immune response to peak above a certain level. Some people will get that peak after one dose, right? And so when you hear those statistics, Pfizer is... A, and I don't, do you know what they are? What, like, you know, there's a 70% chance of immunity after one dose. I don't know the statistics. But you, you know what I'm talking about, right? I do know what you're talking about. So that doesn't mean that you, Thomas, you are, you will be immune in 70% of uh, interactions with the virus. What that means right. is that you, Thomas, out of a hundred people, you have a 70% chance of being one of the people who is now immune. Yes. That it got your immune response high enough that now you have a long lasting immune response. But you don't know if you're one of those 70 or the other 30. That's why you go back for the second dose. Mm. And the reason that they are very specifically timed is that they want your immune response to have a chance to uh, fully peak, but not come all the way back down to baseline. So they want to hit you again before, before the initial immune immunity wears off. Mm. 
so that essentially they can take that peak and they can bounce it from there as the new baseline. And that's the guarantee that mm. it's going to get you up to that next level, right? Because after that second dose, the percentage of immunization goes up to like 95% or something. Right. And that's, again, that's not that you, Thomas, are 95% covered. It's that right. there's a 95% chance that you will be covered. Correct. Got it. If you do not have an immune response to the vaccine, like a noticeable physical immune response, that does not mean it's not working. However, if you do have an immune response, that is a guarantee that it is working. Got it. So for me, for example, when I got I got the, the Moderna, uh, I wouldn't go so hard to say that I had like flu symptoms, but I felt really run down for about 36 to 48 hours, just like, t- you know, sleepy, low energy, nothing achy or anything like that. But I could tell my body, it was like as if I had gotten a cold and, and narrowly averted it like hitting me, right? Mm-hmm. And so I take that as an indication that there is a there's a very good, or like that definitely induced an immune response. Now, whether or not it was enough to get me into long-term immunity, I don't know. But that's my understanding of how it works. So with somebody who's already had it, I could see why maybe at one point they thought, all right, well, if they still have enough antibodies in their system, we could spike it from there. But that just seems like without clinical trials, that'd be a really risky stance to take. Well, and your explanation actually makes total sense of of why they might say that and why there's no reason not to get a second dose. There's a, there, was a, there was like a fact sheet, um, you know, from the CDC. And it was interesting talking about how this vaccine was made. One thing, I, I don't know enough about vaccines. The traditional sort of thing you hear is that they put a little bit of the virus in you to trigger a response. And that might be, I'm curious at how true that is for what amount of vaccines versus what this is, because it says it right on there, they're not actually putting COVID in you. They are putting a protein, they're, they're causing your, your a protein to be made that triggers their immune response to get the antibodies, which is a really interesting, I thought a fascinating part of it. And I'm curious, is that how many vaccines are the, the former versus the latter? So what you're talking about is like an inactivated vaccine, you know, um, Early vaccines, this is this is how they were done, right? Like uh, you would heat kill the vaccine or something, heat treat it, right? Essentially, you, would, you were trying to inactivate it, um, but you still wanted whatever was in it. You wanted parts of it to go into your uh, body so that your body could treat them as antigens and then and f- develop an immune response to that, right? That, so the antigen is the thing that comes into your body. The antibody is, is what you make. And they are customized to the thing that goes in. So the old school way of doing it, and I don't, I, I could be totally wrong, but I know this was sort of the original way of doing things. Well, the original, original way was that you would just inject shit into people. That was the smallpox vaccine, for example, was, I believe, maybe it was heat treated, but it was like, uh, it came from cowpox or something like that. Anyway, that guy was not super ethical in his, the way he, he was injecting into small children, but you would heat treat it so that you would get those antigens in your body. But my understanding is that we have not done it that way for a long time. There are, there may be a few that are still out there. I mean, like polio is, but I don't know anybody who's, you know, in our age range, who's been vaccinated for polio. I mean, that was sort of, we consider that eradicated a long time ago. So now what we do is we find what is the protein that is highly conserved, right? And when I say highly conserved, I mean like it's there in all variants, and so instead of needing the, to produce the entire virus, all you need to do is produce that one protein. And if, that, if it's a surface protein, the idea is that, you know, vi- if you think about, you've seen that anim- animation or cartoon of the coronavirus, right? Has all those little things sticking off it. Yep. You know, those are essentially points that it can mount to uh, cells, but they also act as points that can be recognized as antigens. So if you have an antibody, it essentially is like a lock and key. The protein that's sticking off of the virus is the key, and you have all these locks floating around looking for um, a key. And it happens to bounce onto it, and it matches. As soon as it matches, it induces this whole cascade of uh, of effects where it's saying like, hey, everybody, I just found one of my things that I'm supposed to attach to. This isn't good news, so send in the troops. And whether it's protein or it's DNA or it's mRNA or whatever it is, uh, we just need a part of it. We just need whatever your body is most likely to interact with if it act- if the virus actually gets into your body. But you're saying that's how <clears throat> almost all vaccines currently today, like, you know, the, the ones my kids get as part of their normal schedule, that is what science has evolved to where they're not really putting the virus in to any of the kids or adults. It is only the that common protein that is found. Yeah. See, I didn't see, I didn't know that just as a general, because like you grow up, 
you know, your knowledge about something is kind of the first time you heard it, which for a lot of us adults is like, you know, when we were kids and it's sort of like, well, vaccines are you put a little bit of the virus in and it creates this antibody. And that's what we still think of, which is hilarious because I've heard people who are nervous about the COVID vaccine saying like, well, it's not actually putting it in you to create the antibody. It's messing with your DNA, which is incorrect. I mean, there's CDC. The, the website has a fact and fiction kind of checklist of questions commonly asked, and it's very clear. It's, it's not even touching your DNA. There's RNA, which I think people confuse. Yeah, I believe these these vaccines are all RNA-based. And so there's, you know, RNA is like the you know, the high level heading, and then there's mRNA, the messenger RNA, which is what the mRNA is what a nucleus cell sends to turn something into protein. Um, And so that's, I believe what these are. Uh, I think most flu vaccines are like that. Um, I worked with a company that was doing um, Zika virus vaccines. That was mRNA. Now, again, some of the older ones are whole virus inactivated ones. Polio, I know to be one, because that's kind of the classic example I think maybe there are some old school rabies ones that are like that, you know, so they still exist. I just don't know how widely used they are. Mm. Oh, there are also viral vectors, which is, that might be something that causes confusion where you're actually using an inert virus. And it's usually a, it's a virus that we have like hijacked. There's no viral material in it, but it is a capsid, right? It's, it's the, it looks like, you know, sometimes you see them, they look like those little landing ships, mm. right? Or like the moon lander. And we use that to deliver, mm. you know, uh, vaccine material. It was interesting because they, they were talking about the difference between Pfizer, Moderna, and now Johnson & Johnson. And I recall seeing the viral vector phrase in the Johnson & Johnson, which is interesting. Each of these companies created a slightly different way to create this immune response. Coming up, Thomas gives us the raw and honest look into the ups and downs of trying to get his new film off the ground. My best advice to anyone trying to make movies, quit now. Why do you think I went back to working in biotech? Stay with us. I feel like there's some movement for all the names we buried. The film that I've been trying to make for a long time now. A quick refresher primer. Gosh, I wrote the first draft in 2007. So this is a good sort of case study of the average time span for getting a movie made. Spoiler, it's still not made yet. And it's what? 14 years later. <laughs> right? No. Seven plus 14 is 21. Yeah, you're right. 14 years, shit. Yeah, because 10 years is 2017. I wrote the first draft of this script in 2007. I tried to get it made back in oh, t- 10 to 12. There was actual movement to get it made. So I wasn't trying to make it this whole time. But like in 2016, when we were building out the Bad Theology Slate, I, I stopped optioning it to this other production company because, you know, we wanted to include it with the films that Bad Theology would produce. And in a meaningful way, we have been trying to get this made since 2017. I really thought it might be made in 2018, but then I really thought it would be made in 2019 when there was an actual, there was capital that was already partially raised. And we were going to make a smaller version of the film, like in the in the the low six figures, we had about a third of it, but not enough to get us through production. A company came along and really liked it, and they were actually going to give us a little piece for that iteration of the film. But they said, "Look, we don't want to derail your production, but if it doesn't work out, we would be interested in helping you make a bigger version of the film." And uh, I said, "Okay, let me let me see this through." You know, it was like we had a date, we had October 2019, we had a cast and a crew and locations all lined up. I just needed the rest of the money to get us through production. And I said, let me try. And if I can't, then we'll talk. And I think I took another six weeks. I tried, I couldn't get the rest of the money made. And it was a point to where I had to release cast and crew because they they make their living off of gigs. And I can't ask them to keep holding the month of October for me. So we closed up that iteration of the production. Um, I uncast my cast, which was hard emails to write, and I could have really upset some people. They got it. They were very gracious, and I really want to work with these people again. But the whole point of moving to a bigger version was because the financier had dreams of getting bigger cast, cast that had more of a name that could had more market credibility, so they could we could sell it in the marketplace. So then, end of 2019, we shifted to a budget closer to a million. And we got an amazing new cast attached, people with 
market credibility, indie, indie names, indie uh, value, nobody huge, but it was, it, it made sense for the budget price point. And um, we were officially greenlit in February of 2020. And we officially moved into prep and started spending prep dollars, like getting the molds made for the teeth of one of the main characters because his teeth were too nice and we needed to, you know, have it messed up. So, you know, we paid a casting director, cast all the additional supporting roles. We paid lawyers and accountants and a few of the crew who would who had been working. We did another scout trip. I flew my production designer in from L.A., spent close to $30,000 of prep dollars, and then COVID hit. COVID delayed. Uh, how far out from shooting were we when we so we had we, we started having May, COVID meetings in yep. in February of like okay we should start talking about this but we had like a May start date right or a, late April May start date May eighth like, yeah May, I was gonna say early May like beginning Pretty, yeah early May I remember in January COVID was already kind of in the consciousness and you know you're not really taking it seriously nobody really was sort of talking making you know moving making plans but you were the first one to bring it up. Of like, hey, this is something that you know we should be talking about. And then, of course, March 11th was a big day in our na- in our nation because it was like, I think that's when the NBA officially closed. It was like this huge hmm. thing of like, wait, okay, this is going to be a thing. And the dominoes started to fall. I remember that weekend; it was my son's birthday, and places were still operating fairly normally. Like the movie theater was limited limiting capacity, but there was no mask requirements. But already businesses were trying to adapt just to kind of help social distancing. But it was a normal kind of weekend, and it was the last weekend we went out <laughs> for a long time because hmm. not only did everything start to close by mid-March, I actually got sick with COVID, you know, a, exactly a year ago. It's funny. I got my vaccine today. It's like literally exactly a year ago I had my – spiked my first fever. And even then, it was just like I, I remember because I'm, I had so much of my identity and purpose wrapped up in this shoot, it was like nothing was going to come between it. And I was just like, all right, whatever. Let's get through – this quarantine that we now all have to do and uh, by May we'll still be good. And of course, when that got delayed, gosh, I mean, I, 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 it, that was so hard for me because you're feeling like I've been trying to make this for years. Yeah. We finally, I couldn't make the $300,000 version. I had a million dollar version financed. It's ready. It's like, and now something that is so out of my control and that's, you know, as a controller to to not have control of something like that it's just it really is hard and 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 these are obviously emotional health things that i have to work through but <laughs> you know sue me i'm i'm still growing i'm still learning i mean i was in tears and uh but even then even in tears i was like the worst case scenario in my mind would be like we would shoot in the summer yeah then June production started reopening. SAG allowed actors to report to set. Of course, there was very strict protocols put in place. But uh, plans, people were having plans. Uh, one of my producers already was going to Ohio to make another film like in June. And our producer, main producer Noah was like, all right, August is when we can, I feel like we can do this. We had a new plan. We had a new budget because we had to add like $50,000 for COVID protocols. But our financier um, was not comfortable yet. And partly it was like, are we going to get through production without wasting hundreds of thousands of dollars if someone gets sick you have to shut down Mm -hmm. but it was also what is the nature of this business if we have a finished product in we got to sell this product in the marketplace what's the marketplace even going to look like yeah you know even august i was like please we have to shoot in october like we had a plan i mean i was begging like please like let us shoot. We've got a plan to do this. We even had conversations like the numbers are like going up. We should have shot, you know, in June as soon as it was ready to do that. There was no cases where we were filming. Yeah. That's when they said, we, we can't commit to this level anymore. They were still on board. They still wanted to commit, but they're like, we want to push it to next year. Like we'd be on board for the spring, but we don't quite know the amount. It was something that we we're going to still need several hundred thousand dollars of new equity to make it at that price point. And then of course that fall, Amanda got diagnosed with breast cancer. So I actually ended up getting, being grateful that we didn't shoot in October. Cause I don't know what that would have done to the film. Cause I would have had to bail completely, but then circle back to the spring. They are committing even less. Basically they are pulling out entirely because they're a newish company. And it was like, they believe in me, believe in the project. And they, and they, they were willing to give me like a little bit back in 2019 for the small version over time, they that investment, that commitment grew, but it was also because 
timing, you know, timing was there. I slid into this perfect timeline where it was like, great, let's fully bankroll this film. We'll get a first film. And so it's like by COVID delaying the film, I also lost the window of timing where this company was able to find, was able to get not just one, not just two, but like three other films kind of into production in various stages. And and I lost the benefit of the timing to really be something they would fully invest in. Now they love me, they love the script, they love the project, so they're still in, but it is it is likely the smallest version of their original commitment back in 2019. Mm-hmm. And officially it's something where it's like, when I'm ready, when I have a budget, a new budget and a new date, like let's talk to them and if they can do something, they will. But their capital might be tied up in another big film that just attached a big star and is going to shoot this summer. And And again, timing, like I... I don't, I don't fault these guys for, you know, kind of what's happened. A lot of it is just bad luck or hopefully in retrospect, it'll turn out to be good luck. You know, (laughs) some of these things turn out that way. Having those conversations where it was clear, okay, there's no path to getting a million dollar version of this film made unless I'm just looking for brand new equity. Like most of the budget Mm -hmm. is still out there and that's not something... I really feel like I can do, or I feel like the market is really wet to do. Like people, if if equity people are coming on board, it's for these smaller amounts, unless, you know, some big movie stars attached. So that's inspiring me to pivot back to kind of that $300,000 version of the film. If I have any hope of getting it made this year, and you can make a case, like be patient, like wait till next year. But there's also a point to where patience becomes foolishness in this business because most things get done because you make them get done. And I've waited year and year. I've spun my wheels. This one year experiment of just waiting to see if we can get a million dollar film turned into two years. It didn't happen. I directed my last film when I was 33. I'll be 40 this year. It's like, you know what? It's time. Like I, like if I'm waiting another year, I don't know what I'm waiting for, but also by extension, if I can't fully raise the rest of the money, which I only need like a couple hundred grand, you know, to to make this smaller version of the film. If it's like we're July and I'm trying to hit a September shoot and I don't have that money, then it's like there's a point where I have to pull the plug on this iteration of the film. And if that happens, I feel like I don't know where I'll be, but it feels like, OK, I got to just shelve this project. I have to move on to something else. This has just been the thing I have been trying to make for years if it's going to be made, it's going to be another time in another way. And I'm at, I'm a kind of arriving at peace with that. Like if I can't make it this year in this smaller version, I will just pause it and go work on a script. Try to sell a script. Try to like get it made other way. It's like the reality is in this business, nobody cares about me. Mm-hmm. You know, like nobody the, – the, the, the industry doesn't care about me. There's some fans. There's some film viewers and certainly my – cast crew, my friends and family all love me and care about me. And I feel very rich and blessed in that way. But the industry that I want to make a living off of doesn't yet care about me. And it's hard to make a industry care about you unless you really, either over the process of time, have a body of work that builds upon itself, or you really come out there with something exciting. And so this film is kind of both of that. It's it's another film that I'm trying to get out there with my name on it, but I also think it's something that's really rich and that could really pop. So in a lot of ways, it's become this thing of like trying to make it is, is the thing that's going to make people care about me, which sounds egotistical, but it's I'm thinking about it more in economic terms where it's like, this is the thing that will help me um, <laughs> make this sustain, you know, a sustainable source of income for me, making films and writing films, directing and producing films. So if I can't get the film made, then it's just like, okay, I, I put it away and um, write some more screenplays. I got ideas that turn into screenplays and maybe try to sell them. And it's just like, there will be other things that are other opportunities of making someone care. And then you sell a script or maybe a script I already wrote, you know, the cliff walk that I just finished, maybe that gets made and that gets made in a great way. And someone then says, Hey, who's Thomas Tory who wrote it? I care about you, you know, industry saying that to me, what do you want to do next? And it's like, I've got this film. So all of that to say, you know, the, the work of now trying to get this version made is upon me and I'm I'm equal parts inspired and remotivated to do the work of getting it done as well as fatigued <laughs> and just 
sober about the work because now I'm largely going to doing it myself because some of the other producers that I was going to pay to share the load with, you got to like ask for deferments to make a film this small to get it done. And, and so there's, there's a limit on what I can ask. And right. we made fair with a lot of favors, with a lot of goodwill, very quickly, very cheaply. And I thought that was the only film I was going to make like that. Even the even in 2019, the, that version of this film, All the Names We Buried, it was a lot bigger. I, I wasn't going to make fair again. I wasn't going to make a film like that again. But two years later, I don't feel that way. I'm like, I'd rather make a film. And if it's within the fair economy, I'd rather do it that way than not do it at all. So I'm sort of back on like, got to make a film in two weeks. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Got to ask a lot of favors. Got to ask for freebies. Can I do it? And I don't know if I can. I'm like, I'm trying. I'm going to try. I see a path where I could. But a lot of things have to line up to do it. And, uh, you know, that'll be my work over the next few months because we're eyeing like September. Because um, I can't really leave the house till Amanda's done with treatments, which would be like June. Mm-hmm. I just want to give enough time to to raise all that money. So that's sort of an update on that project, but also a window into the business and this this sort of thing is the norm the rule not the exception so it takes resilience and just gosh you know um a resolve that has a limit certainly i mean i'm you know it's like every every year i test the resolve (laughs) but i'm also kind of like all right back in work mode you know like i cry about it move on make make a movie i'm either gonna make it or not I wish I was equipped to to like give advice in any way about this, but it is a real punch in the gut that it was, you know, that it was so close. Mm -hmm. And I think, I think that is a, you know, is a testament to the fact that it is good and it deserves to be made. One of the hardest things in this industry is, is not being good. It's being good in front of the right people. You have to be talented, right? You have to be willing to work really hard. You kind of have to be willing to debase yourself a certain amount. And I don't mean that, you know, in in any sort of pejorative way, but like in a good way, like you got to do the grunt work a lot of times. And like, sometimes you got to PA to like learn the ropes and stuff. Right. But you also have to like be lucky in that you, you have to write something really good and then have somebody see it. You have to make something really good and then like have somebody see it. And there is this gulf between people who are talented and want to get things made and the people who are would would recognize that talent and make it but they don't always connect and i and i think a lot of times there's a sea of people who are being seen but their stuff is mediocre and it's like well th- this is the best that's available and i see it and i'm like I, like i could make something better than this thomas could blow this shit out of the water but like that was just all that was available at the moment i don't know and so that is a real pisser in this in this industry and there's a third kind of component you're exactly right the third component is also it's not just the things or the people it's the timing Mm. because i had the thing and then i finally after years and years got the people got the financier the cast i had the right timing in retrospect i had the window for that specific version of the film that then covid came and it killed like it didn't delay it i thought it just delay it but now a year later it killed that version of the film that financier his their timing shifted to other projects that are now the benefit of that alchemy of project person and timing um it's funny i was talking to chad who last year in 2020 post covid produced three features he worked on three very small i don't know if they were all half a million dollar but they were all in that range all very you know sag approved covid protocol productions but it was like he was like Indies are back and running. They're still running. And he said, out of everybody I know, you got fucked the worst, Thomas, with COVID. COVID fucked you the worst. (laughs) And I was like, I both appreciated it, but then I was like, I don't want to hear that. Like, I thought I kind of was telling myself it's hard for everybody. It's like this. I was just like, oh, no, I am right. Like, I did get screwed, (laughs) you know, because these other productions, it was like they've they just delayed and they found the path and they, you know, they, they got made. So I kind of laughed because I was like, I don't know if I'm supposed to appreciate that or get more depressed because, you know, you think of the timing and the luck and, and of just like, I going back to our first episode on identity and feeling like I'm turning 40 and I've been, 
I have been working at this for years. And there's a point where it's like, is it just X years away? Or did I miss it? Yeah. Is it just always right around the corner? Yeah. And I listen to ESPN, PTI, and they talk about sports teams. And Tony Kornheiser keeps talking about like Utah Jazz. They're two years away from being two years away. And I was like, I feel like he's talking about me. Like sometimes I feel like that. Or I did, you know, earlier, just like a month ago, just sort of like, man, I feel like I'm a year away from being a year away, sitting on the end of a tarmac with your the plane not even moving. You know, it's just like I I, I had the plane cruising on, on that runway on the tarmac and it was just about to lift off. And like now it's like it's not even rolling. It's just dead at the end of the tarmac, you know? Yeah, I mean like unpacked luggage and <laughs> – and you and you know and those are the things you sort of say before you're like screw it I'm hanging it up and getting a job and it's like yeah. I, that's that still feels so impossible and foreign to me and I still get enough of like a little burst of like a freelance gig or a project here to kind of like keep me on the path and part of the reason it's like I'm excited about pivoting back to this smaller version of the project is because I I operate with purpose when I have a project that gives me purpose that's like okay that's where that's my sweet spot that's where you know my kind of occupational happiness is. So I'm like, oh, cool. I'm not waiting for this film anymore. I'm going to go make it. Of course, I still have to raise the money. Yeah. Or if I can't make it and it's clear this is not happening right now, then it's like, okay, I got to shift that purpose to something else. Let me let me write this screenplay idea that I've had in my head because, you know, I have means of trying to sell it, you know. I have agents that I didn't have, you know, in 2019. You know, that's something new that I now have people who can – help represent me to an industry that doesn't care about me but <laughs> does that not seem as though that's a viable option to like find interest in this film via your agent is that just not what they do i don't really know how agents work or what they do it's a big agency and these are big partner agents they cannot give everyone equal time equal equity you know what i mean it's like i'm i'm one of a hundred clients oh, of course i write an email i ask for something specific they will do a specific thing they also package films and projects try to get projects off the ground this would not be a film they would try to package in this iteration because of an unknown director too small a budget unknown actors they're doing that with 50 other films, most of which have huge stars attached, you know what I mean, that are trying to get a million towards a $5 million project and all this sort of thing. It's just like where I am in the ecosystem and the size of this film, the only path is for me to scrappily make it like I have been, like we like we do, until my value grows to where now it's just like easy for them to put projects around me. And and they've been helpful. Like I've asked them to do things and they've done it, but but finding 170 grand for this project's not going to be something they're really going to help me to do. Who's the biggest star you could that you have considered as like a a, a primary role in this? I mean, I we've talked about this, but I, you know, kind of use the agency to f say could you get this person to read it. Well, we've done that with lesser stars. Okay. And it's, they get them to, they get their people to look at it. I, it's I'm not going to promise a script read or just like, first it's like, if, if there's availability, I mean, you have the conversations when you make in this, you know, and if it's wide open, it's like, we'll make it around them. Then it's like, all right, we'll consider it. But it's also like, how much of your funding, how, how real is this? How much of your funding do you have? Who's the director? Those are the two huge things. And we have gotten passes, you know, they have passed people within my agency, huge stars within my agency that I didn't even try, I didn't even try approaching the biggest stars because I knew that would be a waste of time. But like moderate stars, like a Jesse Plemons, like a Caleb Landry Jones, these guys who have like real market credibility and who are really brilliant. But they're also very, you know, they're 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 in demand. I'm competing for their time on a project. It's really hard to compete unless the time there's all the alchemy of what we talked about. Oh, it's a director I've wanted to work with. It's an amazing script. It's got other stars attached. It's fully funded at a comfortable budget level. Mm -hmm. And the timing works out. And because I don't have like almost any of those things checked, it's a director they don't know. Let's assume they love the script. It's a director they don't know at a budget level that they're really going to have to like bend and bleed for. Um, and then you could say, well, we could raise more money if you were attached. I mean, they, they literally get 10 of those requests an hour. Yeah. And even if my agency is bringing it to them, it makes it credible. Like the fact that I have an agent gets it to them. That's all it does. That then actor 
is going off this checklist where it's like usually because they don't know who I am, like it. And this is why I made that proof of concept because I was like, I'm a liability in this situation as an unknown director. I am a liability and I am, I have no illusions about that. So I made this test footage proof of concept to show people. It was very helpful because it showed people, oh, here's what this director and this DP will make from this material. It was beautiful. It was poetic. They're like, cool, let's make a movie. Let's get it, you know, to them. Let's, let's, you know, turn them loose to do that. But it's like with, with a director, with, with, with an actor like that, even like a Caleb Landry Jones or a Jesse Plemons who, you know, are working on huge productions, the biggest people like the Jake Gyllenhaals, who <laughs> my financier, they co-financed with Jake Gyllenhaal's company two Broadway shows. So like they're 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 actually partners with Jake Gyllenhaal's company. Jake Gyllenhaal would only star in this film if he read it, absolutely loved it, and then took it over to produce for him to star and probably was like, and I want to give this to this other director that I have f- more faith in. You know, people still have to be told what's good. I mean, they all these pe- all of these people have their own ideas of what make, you know, oh, I like the script, but usually they're not sure. I think I like the script and I don't, you know, but then you add the the component of the director, it like all has to align. And it's one thing if it's like hot new Sundance director, his short won the grand jury prize. He's a nickel, like all these other things. It's like, here's his first feature, read this amazing script. Then it's just like, oh, cool. The industry knows who he is. There's buzz around him. There, there's already faith that he's a good creative and he's got the script. Yeah, I'll take, I'll take that risk. You know what I mean? Like that's, those are the projects that they'll take the flyer on. It's not the guy who made fair, didn't sell to a big distributor, has no names in it, amazing reviews, but not reviewed by like all of the major publications, not even reviewed by enough to get, you know, a certified fresh rating. You know what I mean? So it's like, and fair overperformed because our bar was so low of what we wanted to achieve. It's not making anyone know who I am or care about the next thing I'm going to make. So it's, and that's what's clear to me. I've got to go make the next thing by myself again. I'm giving this another shot to make this film this year because it's like it's it's what I've invested so much time and sweat equity into. The bigger version I gave time to, it didn't work out. So now I'm going back. And if I can't make that this year, then. I feel like I would be in a position to pivot, to put that away and to look at the four or five script ideas that I have right now that I could write that are are very different genre wise and seeing, okay, which one should I put my time into? And that calculus would be, which one am I most excited about? But also like, what one could I sell? Because any of these scripts that I have in my head, I would gladly write on my own time, write on spec and then try to get my team at ICM to then sell for someone else to direct. And I would have a lot of joy from just having written it and then selling it. I could pick which one to pour myself into and then sell it into the marketplace that might be having the appetite for it in that moment. And and conversely, my agents are bringing me ideas that are wanting to be written. For instance, I'm on the list to be interviewed as one of the writers for this period um, project with a big director attached. I mean, he used to be huge. He's a very well-known international director. He's sort of at the end of a career. So he's like less hot right now, but my agent thought I would be a good match for the material. And that's part of what they do. And they said, would you be interested? I read kind of the background because it's a true story. I said, I would love to do this. And then it's like, okay, the director's working on an outline of the story he wants to tell. Once he has an outline, they're going to invite writers to pitch their take. I'd be wide open to do that. And frankly, I've been waiting a few months for that email to be like, okay, he's ready now. It's just taking forever because things take forever. I would be wide open to doing that. That feels like the next move for me. But I I guess I've just like, I got to see this this through six more months. Hell, if I just made money as a screenwriter, I would be very happy. And then I could direct every now and then on smaller projects that I want. And there's a path where I can do that. Those opportunities are going to be few and far between until people start to care. <laughs> and so the work of the artist is like, how do I make people care? And I hate, I hate that energy. I hate it. I hate trying to make people care about me. You know, as, as aggressive as I can be, as ambitious as I can be, as, a, as much of an ego as I can have, I actually despise trying to make people care because you, you just feel dumb. You get insecure, you, get, you, you, you feel desperate. 
in the worst times, you know? You are more interested in the parent that ex- ignores you than the one that spends all the time with you? No, and I'm I'm jealous of my friends who work in the business who genu- genuinely have that posture because it's 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 largely a personality trait that I don't have that I that I have to actively try to be patient, to not bug people, to do all that. And I'm jealous of people who just was like, oh, I didn't even think about it. You know, as a counterpoint, though, I have that attitude. And, and, and I, my career has not taken off in the film industry. So it's not a guarantee <laughs> that if you ignore people's phone calls and emails that, it, you know, I mean, that would be crazy if it was. <laughs> Before we go, Justin and I share two picks. Two friends, two picks, as always. Do you have a pick? Oh, God. Two picks? Just the first thing first thing that comes... Naps. <laughs> naps. I like it. First thing that comes to your head, naps. Naps are good. Do you do a daily nap? So let me tell you this. Pre-COVID, not a napper. I, like, I napped in high school, and then I got to the point where I was like, I, once, once I'm awake, if I go to sleep, the rest of my day will be hell. And I was talking to my therapist months and months ago, and I was saying, like, I just get so exhausted, like, in the... the you know, the work day is like, it's the middle of my work day. I work from home. I wor- worked from home before nothing's changed. And now it's like, I just cannot stay awake. I'm like dozing off at my desk. He's like, yeah, you're tired. And I'm like, but I got a full night's sleep. He's like, the world is an existential shit show right now. Just go lie down. And I was like, but I'm not being productive. He's like, w- why are you like, why are you being so capitalistic that like every minute of your day has to be productive? He's like, get rid of that. It's okay to just walk away. And he kind of gave me the same freedom to like, like not feel embarrassed about like wanting to like just take a break and play video games. He's like, just do, like do whatever you want. Like, you know, there's so few opportunities to like relax right now in the world. And um, I, I'm hoping to sort of have that be one of the things that I take out of COVID is like just that the ability to detach myself from productivity and just say like, I need to, and obviously you can take this far in the other direction, but I, I just need to like separate myself for a little bit in a focused way. And then I can get back to my, to my shit. There's a great psychological um, thing on productivity that we, we, I looked at and studied it's, it's, Really great. I forget the how it breaks down, but it basically is chopping up your day into a certain amount of time. And it was like, you need X hours of engagement of a certain kind, but then also disengagement. Like you need X hours of disengagement in your day for like a healthy work balance, work rhythm. And it also extrapolates to your year. Within a year, you need X months on a certain type of engagement and you need disengagement. And that's a daily need over our brain's you know, can disengage. And if that's taking a break in the midday to nap or to play video games or some people, most people it's like, I'm going to end my day watching the television. And sometimes I'll do that. Like sports is my disengagement. It just puts me in a different brain. I'll watch sports. I'll just, and it's like, if I need it, and Amanda knows this sort of like rhythm balance thing, because we've looked at it together. I was like, Hey, I just need some disengagement. It's like, cool. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'll be in the bedroom. I'm going to the bed, and and like 30 minutes of television, it's just like boom. I've got my disengagement. I'm fine. I'm ready to move on. My my office is near my bedroom. My bedroom gets like beautiful afternoon sunlight. The decadence of like walking in there and just laying down for a nap, that it's like I feel like it fills me with guilt. Like this, <laughs> you know, somebody's working. You know, like my kids. You know, they want to like play. Uh, my wife is making dinner. It's like. But then that's what he said. He's like, you have to separate that from yourself. Like, what do you want? What, I mean, this is what he always says. He's like, what do you want and what do you need? Yeah. You have to know what those two things are. Otherwise, everything in your life suffers. That's great. So your your picks are naps. It's a good one. No, mine's um, a company <laughs> sponsored by. It's a company called Blurb because my wife just had her birthday and I made her a photo book. And I've made this before before. So I've like looked through all the photo book companies and they're usually like Shutterfly or Snapfish. These companies that rip you off printing photos and they rip you off more making photo books. But Blurb is designed for kind of people who design their own books and who might want to sell them, whether they're photo books or just prose. And so I found them and I was able to, because I had like hundreds of photos, maybe thousands. So the the book itself was going to be hundreds and I mean, it was still an investment. The time took me a while, a couple of days to make, but I don't know, 60, 70 bucks for the end product book, a beautiful, hardbound, full colored book with hundreds and hundreds of pages because Blurb made it easy. And they have a great software that I downloaded so you can lay it all out. And um, 
if you need to make a really beautiful, elegant book for like, you know, one-off sort of thing as a gift, I'd recommend Blurb because they've saved me a lot of time and a lot of money. And I've used them twice now for making these, like every few years, I'll, I'll get the best family photos from the last, from that time and put them all out in a book. So we kind of have a, from when we were a family of five, when Rylan was born in 2012, you know, our third child making us a family of five, we've got photo books covering that time. So you can look through them, these beautiful volumes and watch our family grow. And if I would have done it through the traditional photo book companies, all of them, I would have spent hundreds and hundreds of dollars. Some of them would like, no, we can't make a book that thick. <laughs> and it's like a normal, it's it's a normal thick kind of coffee table book. And it, that's just not what they do. Even like Google's like, make a, you know, because where all my photos are backed up in Google Photos. Hey, I'll turn this into a book. Nope, can't. They couldn't do it at once. Google said, there's never been a book this big. Exactly. Blurb good. Thank you for listening to episode seven. Please help us grow by subscribing to this podcast. Man, John Mark really helped us grow. We should get bigger, you know, guests on here. You know what? It should just be his podcast. It should be. We should give it to John Mark. Thank you for rating and reviewing us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify. It really helps. Tell your friends about us. Write an email right now. Open the email. Write an email. Pick 10 friends. Say, hey, check out this podcast. We'll wait. If you want to stay connected to us throughout the month, go to our Instagram account at Two Friends Pod. Get in touch with us at Two Friends with a Pod. Podcast.com, which will have all of the footnotes from this episode. I don't think there are any, but if there are, they'll be there. And links to the resources. Naps. Oh yeah, naps.com. They're actually, probably, maybe don't go there. I don't know what it is. Yes, that is two friends with a podcast.com, which you can also email us, hey at two friends with a podcast.com to just say, hey, I like it, or hey, talk about this. Hey, Thomas, if people want to invest in your new film, where should they go? They should go to my bank account at Wells Fargo, or you can email me and get in touch with me or watch my films at thomasstory.com. And Justin, if people want to follow Bad Theology, our film company, where can they go? They can go to badtheologypictures.com, follow us on Instagram at at theology. We've been dropping these episodes every other week. We've been pretty consistent, so keep up with us. We'll try to be consistent in the future. But only if you keep up with us. Otherwise, we're done. Thanks for listening, everybody. Don't stop, never stopping. We love you. Well, yeah, and I feel like instead of making this an easy, small side episode, I've now given myself a ton of editing work. Cheers. Which is like best laid plans. <laughs>